helping out. Um, a, a brother had shared it with me, and um, and I was kind of chewing on it, and then I was about to text him back, and I was going to ask him, hey, so um, why did you send me that passage? And then uh, even as I was about to text back, um, the Lord just really ministered to my heart, and, and the Lord was like, hey, ask me. And um, I had to continue to chew over and over and then the Lord began to minister to my heart from this passage. But I, I just, just this whole book, being a real practical book, uh, speaking of our conduct, and not just our conduct, but really faith that works, intertwined all through this book, the book of James. Uh, it, it's so fitting for the times that we're in right now. And so um, I was really excited to be able just to uh, come and to take over where he left off. So... I know that he shared with you about the, the trial, but I just want to um, I just want to intertwine this um, because as James is writing to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, uh, that that word scattered diaspora it means really scattered seed, and um, like so many today during this time, whether it's the pandemic or the protests, uh, the, the way the economy is getting hit, just the different things that we're seeing right now, right before our very eyes, uh, they're, they're mind-blowing. They're mind-blowing. And what blows my mind is when I get to talk to somebody older than myself, I'm 50 years old, and when I talk to somebody in their 60s or even 70s, and they express to me that they've never seen what they're seeing today, it just blows my mind. And so because of what's going on in the world that we live in right now, whether it's with politics, protests, or, or the pandemic, um, people are scattered right now, and it's even affecting the church. And so um, what a fitting letter that, that this group that was scattered here in the book of James, this, the, the people that James is writing to, uh, those that were scattered from the 12 tribes because of the persecution that was going on. And if you think about it, it was the Roman government that was persecuting and, and really pressing the church. And through it all, uh, God being sovereign would use it all for his glory. And so I just want to, I just want to kind of dial us all in as we continue. And as Fish, when he comes back, as he continues to teach through this book or Pastor Sean or whoever else is going to be covering, um, I, I want to just keep uh, reminding, and I'll, you'll probably hear me a couple times tonight, kind of bring us back in to so that we're reminded that God's in control, and God's not moved by it, and because he's not moved by it, by anything, he's not taken back, he's not shocked, he's not surprised, he's just, God is just sovereign, man, he's the rock, and if he's not moved, as we cling to God by faith, man, he's going to see us through, he's going to see us through whatever we're being confronted with, uh, like I said, whether it's politics, protests, or the pandemic, God's going to see us through. He's the rock. And so I want to encourage people, just keep looking to Jesus, man. He, man, he is not moved. And, and he's doing something with everything that's going on. And so we know that these trials, um, God, is, God is working through them. And God is perfecting us. God is desiring to perfect us, to perfect our faith, to mature us, to cause us to be people that trust him even more so. He's refining us through these fiery trials. So um, keeping in mind that they are in a trial, um, just like we are. And we're always either in a trial, we're coming out of a trial, or we're about to, about to enter into one. So this trial that uh, refines us, it's important uh, that in this trial, that um, we have wisdom for the trial. So pick it up with me in verse 5. He says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. And so um, being in the trial, and the, 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 the 12 tribes that were scattered abroad that James, the half-brother of Jesus, was writing to to encourage and to really uh, minister to them, um, it's important. He says, listen, in this trial, in the fiery trial, uh, it's important to to have wisdom for the trial. And he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, and I love that. He says, look, you might be in that place where you're not knowing what to do. And what is wisdom? Wisdom is the proper use of knowledge. 
Uh, a lot of times we, we might know, we have the idea of what to do, and, and sometimes we might not have any idea what to do. But listen, even though we might have this sense of, hey, I kind of think I know what to do, but the proper use of it, the proper use of it is so, so important. And James, he, he tells these uh, Christians that were scattered, he says, hey, listen, um, ask, just ask for wisdom. And, and the way that it's written there, it means to keep asking, to ask continually. And as you and I ask continually, we can trust that God, he desires. Um, and this is important for us to understand because it says he gives liberally and without reproach. God's not mad at us because we don't know what to do in a trial or because we're not completely sure. He, he's not standing there saying, I can't believe you don't know what to do right now. No, 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 no. He says, no, 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 it's okay. Just ask. If you lack wisdom, ask, and God will give freely without reproach. He's not going to rebuke us for asking, Lord, I, I need wisdom for this situation. I'm in a trial, God, and I don't know really what to do. Um, we need to ask. And you know, God, being a good father, man, he wants to give us wisdom. He wants to impart wisdom wisdom to each and every one of his children. Uh, thinking about the Proverbs, how wisdom cries out. I think it's Proverbs 1, Proverbs 3, Proverbs 8, that wisdom is crying out. And the idea behind it is, man, he is desiring that we tune in to him, that we ask him for wisdom, uh, especially being in the trial. And he promises it's going to be given. It will be given. But we have to ask in faith. We don't want to be like that, that uh, man, uh, that doubting, uh, that one who doubts is like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And if you've been to the beach, you know, it's just those waves just toss back and forth. And we don't want to be like that. We don't want to be a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so it's important for us to be people that ask by faith, and to just trust, this is what your word says, God, and I'm going to ask because I need wisdom right now. And I, I can't think of a greater example than Solomon. Um, as Solomon uh, was asked by God, God told him, hey, you ask, ask me what you want. And man, he asked for wisdom in First Kings chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. His request was for wisdom. He says, man, I'm just a young guy, man. I'm just a youngster, God. I, I don't even know how to lead your people, and they're, they're coming out or they're going in. I, I need wisdom to, to lead your people. And God granted him wisdom, and he blessed them above and beyond his request for wisdom. And the thing, the thing that I love about um, Solomon is that even as he requested wisdom, um, when it came down to it, and he was confronted at the end of First Kings chapter 3 with, with uh, that situation there that uh, he would have to execute wise judgment. Remember those two ladies, and, and um, they, one of them, uh, they killed one of the kids, and then, and then uh, the other one had taken the child from the mom, and, you know, they're, they're fighting over the baby. She's saying, hey, give me back my child, and they say, hey, what do we do? And so Solomon, as, as, they're, as he's confronted with having to exercise wise judgment, you know, and I, if you've ever been in a situation, a difficult real life situation where you're like, uh, you know, and it, you're confronted with it and you have to come up with something right then and there. And you think, gosh, what do we do right here? Like, okay, uh, let, wait a minute, come back in an hour. Let me go pray. And, and sometimes you just need to be ready, man. And you just need to trust the Lord and say, Lord, I need that wisdom. At the beginning of that chapter, he asked God for wisdom to lead God's people in a difficult situation confronted him. And he says, Give me, bring the baby right here. And we're going to cut that baby in half and we're going to distribute that baby. You get half and you get half. And, <gasps> and, you know, the mother said, no way. Let, let her have the baby. Let her have the baby. And, and Solomon knew, man, the wisdom of God. He knew that's the real mom because she loves that baby so much that she's giving that baby up to the other mother. And so not only does he ask for wisdom, because you and I, um, sometimes we ask for wisdom, we ask for wisdom, we ask for wisdom, and then we're confronted with a difficult situation, and we have to execute wise judgment. And so it comes with what? With asking by faith and just trusting. Lord, I've been praying for wisdom, and Lord, help me to be ready uh, that when I'm confronted to be able to execute wise judgment. And Solomon, man, I believe he's just a great example for wisdom. Right here, Pastor James is saying, hey, listen, if you lack wisdom, just ask. God wants to give freely 
without reproach. And so ask, but ask in faith. And so that is so important for you and I, especially in the trial, you know, especially when we're right in the thick of the trial, man. We're like, I don't know what to do. Hey, listen, trust the Lord and, and believe that when we ask for the, the wisdom uh, to know, to have the proper use of knowledge, um, that we need to also trust in exercising and executing, executing wise judgment. And so... Um, in verses 9 through 11, we see that it's important to see things rightly, especially in the trial, the perspective. And so it says, let the lowly brother, verse 9, glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as the flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower fails, or its flower falls, I'm sorry, and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. And so uh, we see here that it's important to see things rightly. He says, hey, listen, uh, don't, don't think that you can see something differently because you're in a different class of, of uh, you know, your, your financial status, you know, the poor man. He says, hey, if you're poor, he says, listen, don't trip. Just keep doing what you're doing. If you're a gardener for the glory of God, he says, don't trip. Just keep being a gardener for the glory of God. He says, listen, don't worry because maybe your financial status is not up there with those other people that maybe we see or we know. He says, look, just keep doing what you're doing. And he says, don't worry because you have... Uh, uh, an incorruptible inheritance that's coming to you. And, and so the eternal perspective is, look, just keep doing what you're doing and don't be discouraged. Yeah, you might not have um, things that other people have that even that you want. He, you might be poor. He's talking to the poor brother here. He says, but don't worry. He said, there's going to be a time um, that you're going to be able to glory in your exaltation. He says, look, and if you're rich in, in your humiliation, he, he says, you are going to be humbled. He says, so um, it, it's okay. Don't, don't hold too tightly to, to those things, those possessions that you possess, um, or even that position of financial status, uh, being a rich person here. He says, look, because the things that you have, they're going to pass away. We're not going to be able to take anything to heaven with us. And he says, look, uh, just like the sun with burning heat, then it withers the grass and its flower falls, its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. And, and so, um, man, he says... Don't, um, don't make that your aim. And especially in the trial, especially in the trial, think about the time that we're in right now, uh, the way that our economy is getting hit so hard and watching some of these things on the news where um, I've seen a couple interviews with these, um, these guys that are businessmen that are on Wall Street and they're, they're working with the stock market every day and they're, they're studying the Dow Jones constantly and these guys are depressed because of what's going on. Some of the business owners, and rightfully so, I get it. I'm not gonna. We don't. We shouldn't expect them to be happy and rejoicing over it. But listen, they're getting hit so hard. Some of them, because that's their whole life, uh, and for some of them, that even is their God, really. And and that's the thing that they cling to, and because they're getting hit so hard. Listen, right here, he um, James is saying, "Hey, uh, if you're rich, don't don't hold on too tightly because um, those pursuits even." Uh, being a rich man, um, they're going to they're gonna pass away. And so we're, we're, um, we're living in a time where people are depressed and distraught and they're worried um, because there's a possibility that they could lose everything. And there are people that have, so many people have lost their jobs and people are losing companies and uh, their, their livelihood, it's affecting their, their home that they live in, their fa- being able to provide for their families. And, and so difficult, difficult times. But listen, Jesus says this. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. But what did Jesus say? Jesus says, look, don't worry. And that, that word worry that Jesus is speaking in Matthew chapter 6, it, it means don't let it be choked out. Don't let it, that word worry means to strangle. And so he says, don't let that strangle you. He says, but 
Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything you need will be added to you. And so it's important that during the trial especially, that we, we see things in their right perspective. And the, the, this is the deal. Um, maybe, just maybe, God is using it and bringing people to this place where their eyes are opened to say, hey, you know, this is what I've been living for, and I, I need to just trust the Lord at this time. And so, um, speaking to the rich man, he says those, those things will fade away in his pursuits. And so it's important to trust the Lord. And, and really that through the trial, um, to not see things through your financial status, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, but to see things through the eternal perspective, to get a right perspective during these times and, and to not make um, possessions our aim. Uh, I was thinking about that saying, one life to live that will soon pass, only what's done for Jesus will last. And if you, I think Pastor James, because Pastor James was really an in-your-face kind of guy. He was straight up. And I, I, I could kind of picture Pastor James saying, are you really living that out? You know, we can quote that quote, you know, one life to live that will soon pass. Only what's done for Jesus will last. And there are times that we are in the trial, especially like today. It's so applicable for today to really say, am I really living that out? Am I really living that out? The things that we do for Jesus, those are the things that are eternal. And those are the things that we want to set um, our, our, our focus on. We want our heart to be set on those things that are eternal and that are going to last forever. And so um, pretty, pretty straight up stuff here. But now he goes into um, speaking about enduring, enduring temptation during the time of the trial. He says this in verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And that word bless, oh, how happy. He says, listen, oh, how happy is the man who endures temptation, that inward temptation. What inward temptation? Well, there's a whole lot of temptations that we're hit with, especially when we're in a trial, you guys. Especially there's this discouragement that wants to set into our hearts and wants us to veer towards focusing on ourself. And uh, we can have a pity party during uh, these trials that we go through. And you're going to see in a minute where uh, Pastor James is going to say, hey, don't start to blame God either. But, but there are temptations, these inward temptations, maybe to quit in our discouragement. To just say, man, I'm done. I'm throwing the towel in. I'm done. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to do right, Lord. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to serve you, Lord. And why are you letting this thing happen? And I'm in this trial again. And, and, and people do. People do get discouraged. And people do throw the towel in. But listen, he says, blessed is the man who endures the temptation, who continues to persevere and doesn't quit. Um, there are temptations to just straight up sin during uh, the time of discouragement and just being done with, uh, you know, their walk. People have walked away from the Lord in the fiery trial because it's just too much for them at that time. Uh, we're tempted to um, walk in the flesh and to make excuses for it, to just kind of have that I don't care attitude anymore. I don't care. And we can, you know, maybe be very verbal to people and lash out in the flesh and and there are people that are tempted to do drugs and to drink to pacify their conscience, if you will, and to, to, so that they can uh, numb themselves. And, and that's where it starts. I'm just going to have a drink. And there are so many different temptations that we can be confronted with in, in the fiery trial. But listen, for those that endure temptation, Pastor James says, blessed is that man who endures temptation. And there's a crown of life. There's a crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. There's a reward, this crown of life, for those that through the trial, uh, they persevere and they, they stay unspotted. They stay unspotted from the world. And, and so, um, man, we want to make that our aim uh, to be recipients of that crown of life. But uh, he goes on in verse, three, verse 13 to say, Let no one, when he is tempted... 
Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. And, and there's a, if you're a, one that highlights or circles the word when, that means it will happen. It's going to happen. Not if it happens, but when it happens. Because we all get tempted. And it's important for us to understand that it is not a sin to be tempted. It's sin when we give into the temptation. But just because we get tempted doesn't mean, oh man, I keep getting tempted. Listen, even Jesus was tempted by the devil himself in Matthew chapter 4. And of course, he was without sin. He resisted the temptation, using the word of God to do battle against those temptations that Satan threw at him. And, and so um, it's going to happen, you guys. And uh, it's important for us to trust the Lord, to hold fast the faithful word, and to be able to do battle when we're tempted. But temptation, uh, it's, it's the battle, the new man versus the old man, and the world and the devil will attack the sinful nature, which is the old man. And he knows exactly what to throw at you, and he knows exactly what to throw at me. And so um, it's important that when we do, when, when it does happen, um, we, he says, hey, don't say that I'm tempted by God. Don't start to blame God. Don't start to blame, you know, some people, we like to point fingers and we like to say, well, this is why I did it. And, um, you know, it's important for us to just understand that we have this sinful nature and, and the devil and the world know exactly what to throw at us. Um, so he says, look, he says, don't, don't start to blame God and to say, it's all your fault, God. And, and so um, there are sometimes uh, people will say, well, I have an addictive behavior. And that might be true, but the truth is we have a sinful nature. We have a sinful nature, and uh, the devil knows that. And so we need to be people that um, just continue to stay in this book right here and allow God to minister to us and to strengthen us. And we need to just do what the Word of God tells us to do. And right here he's saying, look, don't, don't start to blame God or make excuses. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and is enticed. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. And so, listen, we have to keep our guard up. We have to keep feeding uh, the Spirit of God that lives in us and keep building ourselves up in the most holy faith, putting up safeguards, walking in wisdom, and walking in obedience, just trusting the Word of God. But listen, it's important for us to know that when we do give in to those temptations, that it's the result of of sinning, giving into those temptations, it's always going to be death. It, and it's, it could be a slow process. It could be a long, dragged-out process. But the end result is always going to be death when we give into the temptation and we just sin. And so um, he says, look, it always is going to bring forth death, verse 15. Um, and and we, for those of you, and even myself, man, uh, who has not given into temptation, but listen, we have to learn, and when we have to know, hey, no, 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 I went down that path anymore. No, and we have to trust. Okay, what does Jesus do? What did he do when the devil was tempting him? And we have to use the word of God, the sword of the spirit. We have to do battle. Uh, we have to stay accountable to people because, man, um, we all know that the end result being death, man, and, and there, are, there are things that happen where we are confronted with just a whole lot of trouble. You know, a whole lot of trouble giving into that temptation. And I think about Lot. You know, if you think about Lot, when at the very beginning, when uh, his men and Abraham's men were, are, were too many, and they started to butt heads, and Abraham, being that wise leader, man, he says, hey, which way do you want to go? Whatever way you go, I'll go the opposite way. Because Abraham trusted the Lord. And it's, the Bible says that Lot lifted his eyes, and he looked toward Sodom. And he says, man, it's plush over there. And he was led by his eyes. And he would go to Sodom, eventually being caught up in Sodom. He would uh, sit at the city gate. He would call the people of Sodom his brethren. And he just got caught up. And uh, the New Testament tells us that Lot, uh, his soul was vexed because of that sinful lifestyle that he was living there in Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and so um, we know that the angel had to come and, and deliver him 
because of Abraham who was interceding for him. And, and if you look, um, he, they literally had to pull him with force, man, because he was stuck there. He was stuck there. And, and he would be delivered, uh, but his wife would die. And we know that after, as he was in that little city overlooking the judgment that God had brought on Sodom and Gomorrah, we know that um, he had slept with his two daughters. And uh, Moab and Ammon would come about through sleeping with his own daughters. So a sad, sad story. But we saw that uh, giving into the temptation of being led through what he saw and being led by his sinful nature, we see that there was just a whole lot of trouble and we want to be people that veer away from that and so what is the way to do that to endure the temptation to endure to persevere to press through to walk in obedience and so he says do not be deceived my beloved brethren uh, every good and perfect gift is from above and so we do not want to be deceived man the flesh our sinful nature is so wicked the enemy is so crafty uh, but, man, it's important for us to just know, to resist, to resist. And what, what might start as, um, as a fun party, you know, a fun time, man, it will end in death, man. Uh, we're ministering to uh, a man that is homeless that lives in the area where our church is at, city of Norwalk, California, central Norwalk. And this guy's a regular, and he's been around for years. But, um, you know, we've ministered to him, but... We've been ministering to him a little bit more lately, and I, I, I talked to him the other day, and I said, are you all right? He didn't look good. He goes, no, I'm, I'm not. And I said, what's the matter? He goes, I'm sick. And I said, what's the matter? And he just began to cry, man. And like his, I, the hugest tears I've ever seen in my life, man, they were just huge. And this guy is not a man that would cry, you know. And he, the tears were just falling from his eyes. And he says, it's destroying me. And I just said, yeah. I said, it's destroying you. And so what might have started off, hey, I'm just having a good time with the fellas. Listen, it's destroying him, man. He's living on the street. He has no family. And that's what sin does. That is the end result of sin. Don't be deceived. That's what James is saying right here. Don't be deceived. These things that the devil is trying to throw at us and tempt us with, listen, don't bite into it, man. Don't bite into it. Resist the temptation. Because the end result is death. And he goes, that's just the way it is. Don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift, uh, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Listen, there's temptations, especially in the trial, man. And the devil, he's right there. Ah, the Lord doesn't love you, man. If he really loved you, then why is he letting you go through this? And he's trying to get us to blame God. And he's trying to get us to bite into the temptations that he's throwing out there, whatever they might be, making them look all nice and fancy and pretty. And, 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 and James says, hey, listen, don't be deceived. It's going to be... It's, it's, it's going to bring forth death. But he says, listen, the good gifts, every good and perfect gift, if it's really a good gift and if it's really from God, man, trust the Lord. It, it's going to come from the Lord. And the way that he's writing here, when he says it comes from the Father, the way it's written, it means they continually come down. The Father continually has a heart to bless us as his children. And, and that's where the good gift is at. Not the temptations that come at us in the trial, but to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord and to trust in our heart. Hey, Lord, if it's really good, and it's going to come from you. And sometimes we have to wait things out. And sometimes it takes a real long time. But listen, if it's a good and perfect gift, it's worth the wait. I, um, my wife wrote this down. She saw it somewhere. I don't know exactly where she wrote, where she saw it from. But it says this, it's not a blessing if you had to sin to get it. It's not a blessing if you had to sin to get it. And sometimes people, they have things and you, or they're doing things and you, oh, I'm blessed. Uh, I don't know. That could be a temptation. Be careful. Did it really come from the Lord? And if we had to sin to get it, it's not from the Lord. 
But, man, we have to trust he's a good father. And he is, man. And, and listen, he, he wants to bless us. He wants to bless us. And there's no variation in him. It means he doesn't change up. He's always good. And he always blesses us with good and perfect gifts. They come from above. Um, it's of his own will. Verse 18, he, of his own will, he brought it forth. Listen, he's the one who initiates those things that are good. He initiated that relationship uh, that he brought us into. Um, it says that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, of his own will. He initiated it that we would be born again and that we would come into a relationship with him. And so if, uh, with all that he did to do that, we can trust him, man. God is trustworthy. So don't bite into the temptations. Keep looking to the Lord and wait for him, man. Wait for those things that truly are good that he wants to bless you with, man. He's done a lot to show us that he loves us. And so he goes on and he says this. He says, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So he goes, listen, <laughs> listen more. Listen more, and I, I'm sure you guys have heard this, but we have two ears and we have one mouth. And we want to listen double than what we speak. And if you're like me, it's funny, man. I was talking to Pastor Fish on the phone, and, and I do that. I don't know why, but when I talk to him, have you ever talked to somebody on the phone, and they're talking, oh, and you kind of stop at the same time, and then you both start talking to the same, oh, blah, 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 and then he talks, and then, oh, no, and then, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. And then we both try and start talking again, and we talk at the same time. And I crack up, man. I do that with him. I don't know why, but we, um, I do that with more than just Pastor Fish, but uh, I have a big mouth, and I talk a lot. But um, right here, James, he says, listen, uh, in this trial, man, these are things that you need. He says, you need to listen. Listen. Let every man be swift to hear. Be quick to listen. And if you've ever tried to speak to a group of kids, man, uh, the kids, um, they all want to talk. And you're like, wait, 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 wait. And you're like, no, and you're trying to get a word in there. And they're like, no, they want to say what they have to say. And if there's a group of children, and it's like, oh, no, everybody be quiet, you know. And then they start up again. And, and there's something there. There's something there that, that it could be an indication that there's a bit of immaturity if we always want to be the one to have something to say. And, and, and Pastor James is saying right here, he says, listen, this is a quality that you need in the trial is to listen. Be quick to listen. To say, man, let me hear what you have to say. And if you've ever talked to someone, maybe a leader or a pastor or a parent, and they just have that ear, man. Talk to me. What, what's going on? Talk to me. And they just listen to you, man. And there's a wisdom in that, man. And there's a maturity in that to say, I'm going to listen to this person. I'm going to listen. And, and so he says, and be slow to speak. Be slow to speak. And, and then he says, and be slow to wrath. Don't get angry so quickly. Don't get angry so quickly. And so if you know me, man, I'm a person, uh, I'm very passionate by the way that I speak. And sometimes people take it like I'm getting angry. And I'm really not. I'm just loud. And I do get excited and passionate. But chewing on this little passage from James chapter 1, man, I just kind of have been chewing it in. And I says, man, maybe, <laughs> just maybe, I need to pay attention to that. And just maybe sometimes I am getting a little upset. And I have to learn, hey, these are qualities that we need, especially in the trial, man. Why? Because he says, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And I know sometimes people will, you, you know, even in teaching from the scriptures, man, they'll talk about that righteous indignation. And, and really, um, man, I, I've seen few that are able to exercise that, what is called the righteous indignation. When you, they'll, people will say, well, Jesus flipped tables in the temple. And that's true, you know what I'm saying? Um, but that was Jesus. And I know if I flip a table, it's because I'm upset. And I, I don't see that it would fit in the, the category of righteous indignation. Am I, am I going over? 
Okay. How many more minutes? Close up right now. And so um, he said these are the qualities that you need. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just touch on this because I want to finish this part, man. And so he says, um, he says, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers sins, Proverbs 10, 12. Love, man. And I just, man, our, our theme, if you will, or our vision for our church is love God and love people. And, and love is the key, man. Love. In, in love, just listen. In love, hey, just listen. In love, don't get angry so fast, man. Lord, fill me with your love. Um, it says, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And so, hey, just listen. Just, just pay attention to, um, to what people need to share with you so that you can minister to them. And a lot of times... That's, that's really, the Lord will, will use us just listening um, to 30. Oh, okay. Oh, I have plenty of time, so I might even finish early tonight. Sorry about that interruption, you guys. But um, so after he says, uh, um, don't get angry, man. Don't, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. He says, therefore... Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And this is so important. Remember, keeping in mind, he's talking about the trial, man, the trial. Um, being in the trial, all these things are connected. The context is of being in the trial. But he says, listen, um, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. He says, repent. And remove the junk, man. Remove the sinfulness. There's a repentance. There's a removing. There's a laying aside of all of the junk, man. The callousness, the sinfulness, whatever it is. He says it's necessary. It's necessary. Because, listen, remember, being in that fiery trial, God is refining us. And we, I don't know if Pastor Fish shared it or not, but as we're in that fiery trial, man, it's like that gold that it has to be put in uh, just extreme heat man in order for it to liquefy and and as it's liquefying um man um it's so hot the temptation is to come out sooner when we're in that trial but god is refining us and he's purging us and he's and when when that uh, gold is in that kiln and it's the heat is so hot when it liquefies all the impurities go to the top and that goldsmith uh, with his tool, he just skims the top and removes all the junk from the top. And that's what the Lord does. Is he uses these trials to refine us. And as he's refining us, all of these different things are important for us. We need wisdom. We need the uh, right uh, point of view or the right perspective. We need to see things rightly in the trial. We need to be people that uh, endure temptation in the trial and not start uh, getting angry with God and blaming God in the trial and making excuses so that we, we just give in to sin. He goes, look, don't, don't do that. He says, but trust God. He's, gonna, he's a good father, and every good and perfect gift is going to come from him. He goes, hey, listen up. Listen up in this trial. Don't always, you know, talk over, and not just people, but talk over God. You know, and, and that's, we might kind of chuckle at it, but I, I know, I know that there are times where people, they're like, I'm not hearing you, God. I'm not hearing what you're saying right now. And we know exactly what God is speaking. And then there are times where people, they're just like, God, I'm not hearing anything. I'm not hearing anything from you. You're not speaking to me in this trial. What is going on? And, and right here, James says, look, he says, remove the junk. Remove that sinfulness. Lay aside the sinfulness. Lay aside the sinfulness. He said, and with meekness, once there's a repentance and a removal of the junk, he says, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. The truth is this. I mean, all the time, man, wherever we're at, but especially in the trial, we need a word from the Lord, man. We need a word. We, God, we need to hear from you. Speak to us, Lord. 
Speak your word to us. Now, as I'm going through First Kings right, or Second Kings right now, just chewing on Second Kings. In chapter three, um, there's a battle that they're in, and God's people are in, and and they're like, there's no water, and they're like, what do we do? There's no water, and they says, well, is there a prophet around? And they said, well, yeah, Elisha. You know, they said, well, get him, bring him. He hears, he'll give us the word of the Lord. And Elisha comes, and and he's like. One of the kings he didn't want to talk to, but he says, only for the sake of Jehoshaphat, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm here. And, and he says, well, what's the deal? And he says, we need to hear from the Lord. There's no water. What do we do? And he says, bring a musician. The musician comes, starts to strum on that stringed instrument, and he brings forth the word of the Lord, man. And he goes, hey, dig ditches in the valley. Dig ditches in the valley. And as you dig those ditches, God's going to fill those ditches with water. And there might be times where you and I, we just, things are dry. We haven't heard anything from the Lord. Hey, listen, digging ditches is just continuing to just mull over his word. And we might, we might not be getting those revelations, you know, and there are t- those good times where we're like, oh, man, the Lord is speaking, man. You know, it's like, wow. And there might be times that are just so dry and they're so difficult. And in the trial, Sometimes we're just like, oh my gosh, I haven't heard the Lord say anything. I asked somebody last week, uh, a solid brother, man, I said, what is the Lord speaking to you right now? And he just says, I really don't know what the Lord's speaking to me. And that's an honest answer. And I would rather have somebody tell me that, like, I don't know, than try and, well, you know, I'm kind of like in the book of, and it's like, no, you know. But listen, we need to be people that continue just to dig ditches. And as we dig ditches, man, the Lord promises that he's going to fill those ditches. And he did. And not only did he fill those ditches, but he delivered them from the enemy and brought about a great victory. And God will do that. Listen, we need to remove, lay aside all the filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness. And I like that because there needs to be a meekness and as we receive the word because sometimes it might be a firm word. It might be a word of correction. You know what I'm saying? The Lord might say, boom. And we might, whoa. You know, it might be a word like, hey, you need to lay down your Isaac. No, Lord, anything but that, you know. And, and, and the Lord, listen, whatever word he gives us, it's the best thing for us. Whether it's a, a tough thing maybe he puts in front of us. But listen, it's the best thing we need to receive with meekness, the implanted word which is able to save our soul. The, the word, man, it's life to us. And I think about John chapter 6 when Jesus was ministering to the multitude. He had fed the multitude, and he sat his guys down, and he tells them, hey, unless you eat and drink from my body and drink of my blood, he says, then you'll have no part with me. And the majority of the people that were there walked away. They said, hey, this is a hard saying. Who can know it? They knew what he was saying. And Jesus wasn't teaching cannibalism. He was saying, I want to be the very sustenance. I want to be life to you. And as the majority of the multitude walked away, he looked at his guys and he says, do you guys want to walk away too? And Peter said, Lord, where do we have to go? He said, you have the words of eternal life. And that's where we need to be, man. And that was a firm word. He says, I want to be the very thing that gives you life, to eat from my body and to drink from my blood. I want to be your sustenance. And, and, and Peter says, there's no better place we can go from here. You have the words of eternal life. And that is just the truth. The word of God, man, it's spirit and it's life to us. And so, especially in the trial. And so, after he, uh, he said that in verse 22, he says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Man, you know, it's crazy because... Right now, with this quarantine thing, um, everybody that I'm talking to you, I don't know about you, but everybody that I've been talking to, they're listening to so many Bible studies right now. You know, I mean, you just, I mean, we have, we can get on the computer and listen to anybody, you know, get get into uh, somebody's uh, studies and listen to, I mean, I listen to, you know, Joe Foch a lot. And um, right now, everybody's on social media and people are listening to several studies throughout the week and there's a danger in it that because we're listening to all these studies the danger is to think that we're actually doing every single thing that we're hearing and James says listen be a doer not just a hearer 
And like I said, that we're, so many are listening to so many studies right now, but it's important for us because James says, do the word of God. Be a doer. Live it out. There has to be application. There has to be, as we're chewing over the chapter that we read or as, as sitting under the study that we're listening to, hey, Lord, what are you speaking to me about that? How does this apply to me, Lord? And we allow the Lord, as we're mulling over the word and we're chewing the cud of the word, and as we're, we're doing that, um, we say, okay, speak to me, Lord. What are you saying to me? And Lord, I need the work of your spirit in my life so that I can live this out, so that I can apply it to my life. And that is so, so important. James says, live it out. Faith that works. And that's, that's the theme throughout this, this book, the book of James. It's faith that works. And so he says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. And so, man, he says, don't, he says, if you're a hearer only, that's how you are. He says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. And so the perfect law of liberty being the full counsel of God's word, the Old Testament and the New Testament. He says, hey, listen, for that person, and if you're not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one is blessed in what he does. And it's important to, to who doesn't want to be blessed, you know what I'm saying, in all that we do. That person is the one who looks at this right here, this book. 66 books, 40 different authors. And chews on it and applies it. Lord, speak to me through this, Lord. Speak to me through this. Minister to me. And then, Lord, I need you to work in my life so that I can apply these things to my life. The doer of the work, the one who obeys the word, man, is the one who's blessed. Um, we're going through First Samuel with our men's group right now, and we're in the, the part where uh, we saw uh, King Saul's downfall. And, uh, you know, he wasn't leading. There was a bunch of mistakes he made in First Samuel 13, but uh, he made that unlawful sacrifice. And he was not to do that, man. It was only to be a priest that were uh, the ones to offer the offerings, the burnt offering. And because of impatience, because Samuel wasn't there at the time that he said he would be there, um, he got impatient and he was the one who offered the sacrifice. And because of that, that was really the beginning of his downfall. And it was all downhill from there um, all the way to chapter 15. But um, he knew he had the law. He, he knew the way that things needed to be done, but because of impatience, because of fear, it caused him to be impatient, and, and then impatience caused him to do what he should not have done. And so um, it's important for us to be people that not only know in our minds what, what needs to be done, but we need to do according to the word of God. And we saw here uh, in for, or actually, we saw the other night in First Samuel 13 that um, King Saul was disobedient, man. And we know in chapter 15, he was told to destroy everything from Amalek, not to bring back any spoils. And he spared Agag and all of the livestock, man. And there was disobedience. And, and so what was that word to him from Samuel the prophet? He says, look, Saul, it's better to obey than to sacrifice and to take heed than to offer the fat of rams. And so obedience, be, being people that are applying the word of God to our lives and, and walking it out, living it out. And, and so it's important to be people um, that are not just hearing it, but that are living it out. And so he says this, he says, Verse 26, if any among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. And, and so, again, he says, if you think, 
<laughs> if you think you're a religious person, you know, he says, look, but you can't even bridle your own tongue. Man, he says, you're deceiving yourself. He says, but pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. He says, look, there is this pure and undefiled religion and, and it's, it's to visit, to visit orphans and widows with the sense of helping them out, ministering to people. And if, if it's not just uh, seeing somebody in need and just leaving them there, hey, saying, hey, the Lord bless you. Or, or, and sometimes we get, oh, we'll pray for you. And, you know, and we even forget sometimes, you know. But, but listen, he says that pure and undefiled religion is seeing that. And, oh, man, we need to do something to help this person. Or these people, and I—that's one thing that I love as as I look through the Gospels, is if you look at the life of Jesus, man, Jesus never passed people by that were in desperate need, man, and Jesus was one to minister to the outcasts, and I love that, man. I, I love that Jesus would go up to people and touch the leper, man. He would minister to people that the religious leader of the day would despise and look down upon. Not so with Jesus, man. Jesus was never too busy to minister to people that were in need. And he would go up to that person and he would always call out that person that was, had the greatest need. And he would minister to that person. And there's an undefiled religion before God there, man, uh, reaching out. And so I want to encourage you guys, um, even in this pandemic, man, listen, we can pray. I, I love when Paul, in the book of Philippians, he says that uh, even though he was chained, the gospel was not chained. And he says, hey, I'm locked up right now, but it's actually turning out for the furtherance of the gospel. What? That's crazy. You're locked up, you're chained up, and you're saying it's for the furtherance of the gospel? Listen, he was ministering to the people that he was chained to. And it would, it would reach the palace there, the palace guard. And he was ministering to people. And he was effective right where he was at. And listen, I know things are different right now. I know things are different. We're, we're not used to it. But there are things that can be done. As the Lord leads us, of course. And lastly, he says to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Um, staying pure. Not being defiled uh, with worldliness. Romans 12, 2 says this, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God help us to be people that stay unspotted from this world, especially in the trial, especially in the trial. And so I know there was a lot there, man, but, but a powerful, powerful chapter. Um, I'm excited for you guys, man, as you continue to go through this book called James. And so the Lord bless you guys as you continue to not only hear the word of God, but as you do the word of God, as you live it out, as you apply it to your life, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, man. Let's go ahead and pray. God, we thank you for just uh, that fitting word tonight, Lord. It, it is so applicable for today, Lord, with what we're being confronted with in the world that we're living in right now, Lord. A huge trial, and then there are so many personal trials within that, Lord. And so we thank you for the instruction of your word. We thank you for the encouragement that you give to us as we're in these trials, Lord. We thank you for the sure word and clear direction that we have even tonight, Lord, even through James chapter one, Lord. And so, Lord, we pray that uh, your word uh, would take place, that we would receive it with meekness, Lord, that implanted word, it, which is able to save our soul and to direct us for the days that we're living in, Lord, for what we might be going through today, Lord. And so, Lord, help us to steer clear of biting into the temptations that, 
the devil's throwing at us and even that our flesh gives into, Lord, strengthen us, Lord, so that we continue to endure, Lord, the temptations and to be people that have patience, Lord, and wait for you, Lord, that wait for the good and perfect gift which comes from above, Lord, that comes from you, Lord, because you're good. And Lord, we just thank you tonight, Lord, and ask you to continue to go before us, Lord, and we just uh, give you praise and thanks tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. The Lord bless you guys. We're gonna close in a song.
Amen. Lord, may we just worship you um, until the end, God. You say that you're coming quickly. And Lord, I ask that we would just be people that would look for you, that would just hasten that day, and that we would live for you, Lord, in obedience and according to your word, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys.